Uh, thank you, Lawrence and Lynn. Uh, thank you, Michael. Thank you, Janet. Thank you, Chris. Uh, thank you all for, for uh, making this happen. Thank you for picking me among other uh, very competitive candidates. And most of all, thanks, Sophia McLennan, who is the main reason I know about the democracy initiatives in Penn State, uh, that I visited Penn State, and who was my, my host and guide when I was talking there, as well as my partner in crime when we were doing this uh, little essay. First of all, let's give some attention to the queen itself. Here is the medal. So you can virtually uh, do the hands and then, you know, I can accept it. And then we can play around the virtual applause. Yes, like this. Okay, perfect. Uh, I'm, I'm so sad I'm not there live. I, I love classrooms. I love places to talk. I love stage. Uh, Penn State was one of my favorite stages. And, and uh, so let's go through this little bit of the work and a little bit of what this research is about, a little bit what essay is about. And then let's, let's try to dig into something that I'm very passionate about, which is the world of creative activism. Once again, Q&A uh, uh, is there. I'll try to keep it short to let you guys more time to ask questions because I really would love to, to get to the things through interaction rather than me delivering you another boring lecture. I'm, I'm sure that everybody who's on a call is sick and tired of Zoom lectures. I know I certainly am. So, okay, let's go to the, to the, to the uh, uh, part where we, where we talk about the stuff and let me try with uh, sharing my screen now to see how this works. Well, it worked in a, in a early stage. Okay, should be share. And then we go here and this is where we are. Okay, so hope you're all seeing the screen. Uh, the topic of today's uh, lecture, the topic of the of the little thing that Sophia and myself produced as a benefactor of this of this award, uh, is this idea that uh, humor really works in nonviolent struggle. Uh, I'll start by by explaining a little bit about who I am and how I came to this to this activist world. Well, this was me. Uh, uh, the, the teenager with the bass guitar playing in a goth rock band. And I was about 19 uh, when, the, when the nasty things came to my home country, Yugoslavia at the time. I was born in Yugoslavia, which split apart over four civil wars into six small ridiculous states. Mine is called Serbia now. And uh, basically at this time, uh, I was a, you know, average Serbian student interested in playing bass guitar, fishing, studying biology at the time. And I really thought the activism is, uh, you know, thing for boring old people who care for cats' rights, things of that kind. Uh, it was not, it was not uh, uh, before I was 19 and figure out that activism can be cool. And that was the time when Milosevic was launching wars and the campuses started to, to mobilize and mutiny. And very much like your summer of love, the 1992 was a summer of love in Serbia. And that was my freshman year on, on Belgrade University. And this is where I really uh, focused on the idea that all the cool people are there. There's this big injustice there and you need to do something about it. Moreover, uh, I'm a typical example of, of that uh, the chance makes a, a call or chance makes a career. I was thinking that I will be doing animal planning type of footage and, you know, researching animals. I ended up uh, spending most of my life in activism and training people how to build movements. Why? Because when you're faced with a desperate situation, whether this is a polarization, a huge wave of nationalism, uh, religious hatred, this is all we witnessed. And then the downfall of economy followed by international isolation, which is all that I witnessed uh, within, my, within my early age. You have two choices, you can fight or you can flee. I assume I was the stubborn one, so I stayed up to fight. So fast forward to 998, uh, uh, Serbian students were very active, 992, 996, 97. We launched the stray of protests. Uh, we, we caught Milosevic uh, accountable for stolen local elections in 96. 98, we figure out that the opposition can't do it. International community won't do it. We need to try something by ourselves. 
which is where amazing youth movement called Otpor, or Serbian word for resistance, was born. Out of 11 people, mostly veterans of previous, previous students' movements, uh, we grew up to 25,000 uh, within the range of uh, over two years. Uh, we mobilized unprecedented number of young people to vote, proving that participation is what safeguards democracy. We were able to recruit 30,000 people just to monitor the ballot boxes because Milosevic used to steal vote. We were able to per persuade hopeless Serbian opposition to unite around one presidential candidate who won the elections in 2000. And after Milosevic stole those elections, uh, we were capable to put a uh, 7 million country into the standstill through general strike and mass protests, ending with a probably largest single mobilization in the Serbian history, October the 5th. Milosevic stepped down and concluded. Then I tried a little bit to change the beast from the inside, sitting in the government in the parliament for three years. I must admit, these were not the three most fun years of my life. And then people from around the globe start coming to us, uh, be, whether through reading or watching the really cool documentary called Bringing Down the Dictator. They got this idea that Serbian movement was somehow replicable. So they wanted to do this thing at home. Fast forward to 2000, the last 15 years I spent working with movements across the globe, teaching social movements on the universities. And this is where my story and affiliation with uh, both topic of Brown Medal Award and the topic of this little book, which you can take from free as Amazon Kindle book, Pranksters vs. Autocrats come in. Well, you know, you always imagine the revolution as a serious business. You take a look at the Castro or, you know, Mao Zedong, all of these guys from, from 60s and 70s, uh, you will see that they are quite serious, Lenin included. And of course, you know, social science will tell you they are serious because they are involved in serious business of the revolution. But when you take a look at the middle of the, of the slide or the TV screen, this is a portrait of a, of a typical 21st century protester, full of colors, uh, walking in a kind of the parade, very cheerful. So examining these things and really digging into the movement, there is this question whether the face of the social revolution is more serious or more smiling. First of all, the people I'm dealing with are dictators. And uh, obviously they want to portray themselves as a, as, a, as a really serious people who hold their firm hand over everything. Uh, Upper left corner is Milosevic. I just want to put a face on a name that I will be repeating like this gray uh, bureaucrat looking like just he walked up from a closet of 70s. And when you take a look at the Putin, when you take a look at all of this, all of these guys, they really tend to be serious. Unlike that, the people who challenge them tend to be unserious and tend to do, even with a serious business of strategically organizing under dictatorship, either under the worst conditions in the world. I spent my morning talk, talking to the Burmese people who are dying in dozens every day, opposing military junta. The spirit of humor, the spirit of wit is what keeps these movements alive. So passionate about this, uh, we wanted to learn more. And most of our work on this brown metal thing and the work that uh, Sophia will also layer outline is looking into this phenomenon how this wit and the spirit of coolness and the creativity really impact social movement. And what may be the science behind this? Can we give it a name? Can we connect it to numbers? Can we make a data set? Can we make a pattern? So first of all, historically, if you take a look at the at, 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 at struggle starting back from Salt March all the way to, to the downfall of Soviet Union, the world is full of pranks and very often uh, people were facing harsh oppression and fear with the pranks. Take a look at the perestroika time where Soviet Union was falling apart. And within the largest prey of Soviet Union, Poland, the great movement of solidarity was trying to get rid of the communism. And just to remind you, solidarity was faced with 1 million Soviet troops. So military struggle was not an option. Now, how do you deal with such a superior and ruthless enemy? Uh, take a look and dig into the history. And there is this very particular group in, in, in Polish movement that was doing amazing pranks. One of them uh, replicated over time with people who were facing state propaganda was organized in, in uh, Poland. 
7.30, TV news. You have all of this official, boring, Bolshevik propaganda on TV. People don't want to watch it. First, they start going on the windows and hitting pots and pans. Then they come to amazing idea to put their TVs in stroller and stroll them for a walk. What a better way to perform when you are faced with a gray state propaganda. Now, this comes with another element that Sophia and I are very passionate about, which is the element of dilemma. You know what you do with angry rioters. Police is trained well to deal with the bulk of hungry people on the street. Well, what do you do with the cheerful crowd that are strolling their own TVs through the neighborhood? You let them go. So you also encourage others to do that. Or you arrest them and charge them for walking their TVs and strollers which is not punishable even by, at the time, Bolshevik laws. So with creativity, dilemma has been with us at all times. Of course, Serbs don't read books, we learn by doing. So this was our very politically incorrect idea of how to make Milosevic notice that our movement exists. In summer, in summer 1999, we came out with the Milosevic portrait made on a petrol barrel. We brought the petrol barrel into the main pedestrian and shopping zone. The petrol barrel has a hole on the top, so you can really put a coin. And by putting the coin, you bought yourself right to hit Mr. President three times with the bat. Of course, now this makes noise. The shoppers come in, they queue, they wait for this. The kids are having fun. Everybody's hitting the poor Mr. President's face. And here we are in a nearby cafe having espressos and observing the situation. But that was not the fun part, even a lot of people had fun. The fun part was when police arrived. So now what these poor people will do? Arrest us, we have nowhere to be seen. Arrest downtown shoppers, bring them to the police station and charge them with exactly what? Of course, they did the most stupid and the only thing that they could do, they arrested the barrel. Of course, the cameras were there. So now have the photography of the hatred and fearful uh, fearsome uh, Serbian police dragging the barrel with a distorted face of Mr. President and arresting the barrel. Here we are pressing the low charge against the police. We want our money back. We want our barrel back. And they become the, the punchline for another prank. Once again, dilemma element. If they let people doing this, it will happen everywhere. If they react to it, they will look stupid. Now, we did a lot of humor and pranks, and as picture says more than thousand words, the video says even more, which is where I really would like you to take a look. Demonstracija novog programa Glasačke mašine 24. septembra širom zemlje. Konačno! Okay, so here is this guy responsible for four civil wars, trial for crimes against the humanity, running serious police force that had blood on their hands, controlling state apparatus, media, being called butcher for Balkans in the West, being sanctioned by UN, being bombed by NATO, and still in power. And there is a bulk of young, crazy kids which are putting him on a petrol barrel or treating him as a machine washable stain. Of course it's cool. <laughs> so now this outlines the second reason why humor and wit works. They make movements look cool. People love joining cool things. When people are joining, the movement is increasing in number. There is a scientific correlation established by many scientists, uh, uh, recently by Erika Chenovet and Maria Stefan, which shows the clear connection between the participation and diversity and level of success. The more and more diverse people you have in the movement, the more you're likely to 
succeed. Nothing attracts people as being one. And you know this from your private lives. Now, fast forward to this, another very interesting thing which we noticed is that if you do something effectively, if something really works, if something creates dilemma, if something is a successful prank, people tend to replicate it. So from Serbia to Sudan, there was a day in time, I got an email from a friend of mine who worked for a, for a big press bureau in the Middle East. He sent me a link and said, you must have been training these people. I say what? So you, I, I just spotted this amazing Sudanese group and you know, they must be your offshoot. I said, I never heard of them. But then I clicked the link, went to the YouTube and this is what I see. Remember the washing machine? Here is the Sudanese version of washing machine. إذا كرفتها ما تزعل عندك صابونة قرفنا بعد عشرين سنة بدون تغيير الموضوع ما هي عاوز ليه ودايك 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 وعصر 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 لكن النتيجة تعجبك صابونة قرفنا إنتاج محلي من أجل مستقبل السودان Okay, you get the idea. Replicability. So if something is cool, if something is working, if something is low risk, if something portrays your opponent as a basically thug or an idiot, it's likely to be replicated. So one of the things we were focusing on our research is also the replicability of these things, because the, if things are replicable, they certainly work and impact other people. Later, Girifna, the organization you've seen in this short movie, became the think tank of the revolution in Sudan in 2019. That was one of the most in inspiring changes. And, uh, you know, but early in the process, you can figure out who has a talent, who has the idea, and I think this is one of the of the reasons why this research really makes sense. You are searching for creativity, you are searching for strategic approach, and when you find a group, it's very likely to be the group which will be on the cutting edge of the change in a in a certain environment. Of course, 2011, the explosion of social media brings us to the new class of leftivism, which is, you know, online thing. So this is a little screensaver we borrowed from. Egypt, remember Egyptian revolution started 19 days after the Tunisian. This is the typical Windows thing, like installing freedom from Egypt to Tunisia, bam, there is a virus, you need to remove virus first. Internet is full of the pranks and, and dilemma actions, and we are having the whole cluster on online mobilizing and dilemma actions. So as you can see, as we progress through this presentation, you will see how the wit progresses, but you also see people rallying around different stuff. We're in offline and online world. Welcome to Putin's Russia. 2012, another rubber stamp elections in Russia. Some people, well, Putin would win them with 62% probably, but for some reasons, uh, his, his followers wanted him to win with 80. And in some case with 103% of the votes. So what happened was that they were stuffing ballot boxes. And because this is a 2012, people have smartphones, they taped it, it goes viral, the protest starts on Bolotna Square in Moscow. And of course, clever as he is, the Putin leaves people to protest in Moscow and St. Petersburg, but bans protests everywhere else. Well, the small place in Siberia, Barnaul, which I couldn't find on the map, People came to the idea if they can't protest, their toys can. So they won, they come to this village square, they bring their legal soldiers, their little penguins, their cars. Everybody's equipped with a transparent, you know, 146 for Putin, give us free and fair elections. The people are taping. There is an actual footage on Guardian website of that day. And what you will notice if you look at this footage, everybody has fun. There were like two policemen and they were taping as well. So, you know, the small place, people love each other. So that was not a big issue. The big issue was once uploaded on YouTube, 
it got 750,000 views in six hours. Well, some of these views were, of course, from Kremlin. Now, these strategists of, of maintaining status quo were looking at it and say, oh, oh, we need to do something about it. Because if people see, they can replicate it. And soon, you will have a wave of toy protests across the country. And then the phone rings and the poor soul, the chief of Barnold police, needs to go in front of the cameras and actually ban the toy protest stating that officially protest of 100 Kinder Surprise people, 100 legal soldiers, 20 model cars is banned because toys are not citizens of Russia. And by constitution, only citizens of Russia can protest. Okay, good job, man. You actually made the most stupid sentence in the history of the law enforcement. Plus you ended up on a cover page with The Guardian. So now you see another effect of this. This is sometimes related to egos. We are talking about Putin. You know this guy who loves to pose shirtless, show his biceps, tame horses, wrestle tigers, dive for amphoras, save dolphins from drowning, and he's afraid of toys. Now you see the outsized effect of the creativity. It takes probably five people and five dollars. Well, you don't need dollars. If you have kids, you have you have a decent cohort of protesters in your home, toy protesters, to organize this. It takes a platform to make it visible, but then what really makes it internationally visible and what you really put a price tag of it is your opponent's response. So now you see another element of dilemma action is not only that you poke, but you expect the poke to be met with action. And then there is a post-production of this where you are actually capitalizing on police arresting Barrel, capitalizing of chief of the police banning the toy protests. Even in the harshest situation, Syria, 2010, you can find a spitting image type of YouTube videos. Fast forward to last week. This is like these, these two slides are from last week. One is the wave of snowman protests. You have the protests in Belarus, which are amazingly creative. We have a cluster of cases from Belarus. And of course, there's this white and red flag, which is banned by the Lukashenko, the last European dictator. And then you have the dozens of snowmen appearing across Minsk, and they're all red and white. And what the police does, they come into people's yards, actually detain people, bring down the snowmen. So you see the level of fear of your opponent, once again, these actions are effective and one of the fields that we are looking at is a change of narrative. If you're really such a tough guy running Belarus with iron hand, how in the world could you be worried about the white snowman with a red scarf? That tells a lot about how insecure and weak you actually are. What's happening in Myanmar, put the hashtag on it and you will get a daily feed of amazingly creative actions happening in Burma, country which after the gradual opening to democracy and victory of the ruling pro-democracy party experienced a bloody coup just a month ago, well, month and a half ago, the military decided that they, they don't wanna play democracy anymore because they got only 8% on the elections. So they seized the power again. The level of these protests, the with <laughs> on these protests, you know, you have a military really killing people and then people face it with the march of Disney style princesses. So people come in their Disney costumes. Another group of people come out with a strange pets. They come out with lizards saying the lizard has more brain than the ruling general. They're coming out with pythons saying this python is six feet, which is taller than our top general, the person who is very obsessed with his, with his shortness. So. Now you see all of these things happening and unfolding en masse. Question for Sophie and me, an amazing team of young people, some of them soon to be graduated from Penn State, like amazing channel in tech who made this research possible is, is there a pattern? Can you really look at this dilemma action and decide what you wanna do? Can you take a look at the clusters? Why they sometimes peak, you know, have this peak of leftivism and dilemma actions in US ranging from 
you know, climate change struggle, women's march struggle, uh, gun control struggle, anti-corporate struggle. So what happens? Why these things boost sometimes? And is there a pattern in it? And also a larger question for Sofia, who spent her most of her career watching late night TV shows, which is the coolest thing to do, and trying to figure out what is the role of satire, whether satire makes you more intelligent and things of this exciting kind. So what's the difference? How is leftivism different than just the political satire? The simple answer is satire is satire. Leftivism is a strategic approach to nonviolent tactics. It contains element of humor, but behind it is strategic planning to put your opponent between the rock and hard place. If they react, they will look stupid. If they don't, they will look weak. And there is no middle ground. There is a price tag for both reacting and not reacting. And my organization Canvas, which teaches people across the globe how to do this effectively, has a presentation on dilemma actions. And we also noticed the groups that were trained are more likely to produce this type of dilemma actions and loftivism. And there is a little scheme uh, also embedded and, and detailedly explained uh, within the pranksters versus autocrats, which is derived from, from the Canvas core curriculum, which says it's not about the tactic, it's about the topic. So what you're looking at, you're looking at the government's or opponent's policy, which is against the widely held belief. So you have censorship, you have the right to accurate information as a widely held belief, you have all of the pranks related to the media. You have the idea of restricting freedoms of gathering. And then you have people in Belarus gathering on a square. So the, you can gather there like five people or less. Other than that, it's a rally. So now you have seven people. But these seven people are not rallying. They are walking in circle and reading the state's constitution. So if you are the government, what will you do? let people break ban on five people. So if seven of them can gather, 70 will gather. Or you arrest people for reading state constitution loud in the park, which makes you look completely stupid. So looking into lock accountability, once again, amazing cluster of cases, pay your attention to the group called the Yes Man, probably the, the, the person on the right is the person who probably is the most creative anti-corporate loftivist I've ever met. Uh, his real name is Jacques Sevin. He lives in New York, runs the Yes Lab on, on NYU. And he came to this idea of a fake uh, uh, recognition. So you have this big Volkswagen scandal. Volkswagen is accused for actually hiding their carbon emissions. And here comes the memo of Volkswagen where Volkswagen officially apologizes to the consumers and the public in the United States, because last year they, they sold 35,000 cars, which allegedly were very green, but actually were very polluting. There's only one problem. This is not coming from Volkswagen. This is coming from Yes Man. So now if you're a Volkswagen, what will you do? You have option between bad and worse. You can deny the authenticity of the apologize and look like you're not apologizing. Or you can apologize and thus grant the pranksters victory. So once again, when you take a look at these cases, the book looks into 40, we are around 200 cases now. They are coming from all walks of life. Only part of it is pro-democracy struggle. A lot of this is corporate accountability. What well, it is about the small things. There is a whole cluster of human creativity about the, such a simple problem as a pothole. There's probably 16 or 17 cases where people were using dilemma actions and leftivism that we were capable to identify around potholes. Yekaterinburg, Russia, the large potholes and the promise from a mayor that they will be fixed by whatever, April 2012. Well, it's November 2013 and nobody really fix it. It's October 2015. So what people do, they hire a street artist, they put the mayor's face around the pothole. 
So what happens when you hit the car into the pothole, you curse. Now you have a person to curse. Great as it is, the Russian government come and remove graffiti, but left the potholes. But then again, that didn't stop cursing. Now you move to another part of the world, Panama City, the fastly developing place with the falling infrastructure. People hate to the technologically advanced idea. They put a little machines, which looks like a hockey packs, which you see in the middle of the slide into the potholes. What happened is when the car hits this machine, it tweets and it tweets straight to the mayor account. So what happened is that, you know, it's like, oh, I'm a pothole number 32 at the corner of Columbia and, and San Miguel Street. And I just heard the card of this wonderful lady, fix me, fix me, fix me. They go to 15,000 tweets a day. What would you do if you're a mayor? Ignore the problem and become a punchline or fix the potholes and grant people who came with a prank of victory. Oh, of course, low tech people like in Serbia would plant flowers. We found people in Zimbabwe planting trees into the potholes. We found people making fishing ponds out of the potholes, you know, scaling. If you have a very large pothole, you can make it into fishing pond. We found Brazilian activists who celebrated the birthday of a pothole, just to name some of these amazing cases. So once again, it's not only about democracy, it's about accountability, it's about environment. But it's not only big things, people against the dictator, people against junta, it's also about the small things. So it tends to appear that dilemma actions and loftivism are the, on the cutting edge of these movements and they seem to work regardless of the size or the type of the struggle, which is exactly what we want to prove in this research. Okay, to finish with America's uh, Hot topic number one, we all remember what happened on January the 6th. Can you use the humor and pranks to fight hate, warmongering, racist groups? The answer is yes. And there is a cluster of cases proving how these groups were challenged effectively. Looking from Finland, where people were having the problem with a Nazi group called Soldiers of Odin, who would go around in their black uniforms and march, supposedly defending the native Finnish people from evil immigrants. Narrative sounds familiar. And of course they were doing it in, a, in a immigrant uh, heavy areas to scare these poor souls. Well, instead of attacking them, the, the liberal activists in Finland came to the idea that they will accompany one of the soldiers of Odin with lodlers of Odin, which means the clowns of Odin. So now instead of uh, having social media pictures of a proud people marching in them like uniforms, they look like, you know, they are, they are, they, they are staged, a, a, they are staged a, a prank. Everybody's accompanied with a clown. So what they will do, if they ignore clowns, they appear like clowns. If they beat clowns, they appear even worse. So that's one of the cases where you were using pranks about uh, about the alt right. Another one, Wundesdale, Germany, amazing small city up north, pretty liberal by itself, but being very unlucky to be a birthplace of Rudolf Hess, one of the Hitler's uh, top uh, top collaborators. So every year at Rudolf Hess's birthday, the army of of people in black uniforms from across the Germany come there to march. For years, the local citizens were scared and getting into houses and didn't want to go on the street until somebody came to the idea to turn the Nazi march into the fundraising opportunity. Going to local businesses, getting money for the organization called Exit Germany, which is basically the organization that cures people with extreme ideas psychologically and institutionally, they were capable to mark every 100 meter of march. So by marching every 100 meters, the Nazis were donating 2.5 thousand euros to their main opposing organization. Now, instead of hiding in homes, the people are in the streets and they are cheering Nazis for actually participating in this fundraising. And what the guys will do? 
They can pick to be used as a fundraising tool for their opposition and, you know, kind of mocked by thousands of people in the town they normally terrorize, or they can cancel the march. So they can decide between lose and lose. So once again, wherever you look, there is a tremendous scope of this dilemma actions. To summarize and, and get forward what we figured out, humor breaks fear and apathy. It's a normal uh, human type of behavior. If you are preparing for a major surgery, what you want to do is hear a joke, not to hear how the surgery will go. Also, if you're on a very boring party and somebody really humorous appears, that turns the tables and makes the party really fun. Second, humor makes your movement cool. And people love hanging around the cool people. People love joining the whole thing. So humor increases participation. Humor changes narrative. It can turn the very frightful pillar like the police or very tough guy like Putin into the punchline. They can turn the tough, a remorseless hockey player like Lukashenko into the person afraid of snowmen. Humor also tend to really create situation in which your opponent is put between the rock and the hard place. And sometimes the opponent will react in the most stupid way. Namely, you can use this activity for a secondary action. And a lot of these actions get replicated. People in power tend to have a very well floated ego, if you want, or a very distorted picture of themselves. They just take themselves to Seriously, if you poke them, they're very likely to, to, to have a very ballistic response to this, which then can be used for continuous mobilization or turning the tables in the public opinion. Without further ado, through my, my work in the last 15 years with Canvas, uh, through the research for my first book, Blueprint for Evolution, uh, uh, through tremendous experience of the people we were working with, but also through the hundreds of cases we identified that happens uh, 30, 50, 70 years ago. The first one that we identified was in 18th century. Uh, there tends to be that the creativity beats fear, the creativity beats apathy, but there is a pattern in it. You can think strategically about how you frame your tactics. You can quote your opponent between the rock and the hard place. And once again, this is why I'm so thankful to, to, uh, uh, to the McCartan Institute Committee, to the people who gave us the opportunity to launch this research. I'll recommend you reading this is a very easy read. It's a, it's a non-academic read. It outlines amazing things, but also just to say that this is the work in progress that we will continue building this database of cases. We want to bring the dilemma actions and, and loftivism closer to the people in academia, but also closer to the learning process of activists across the globe who are fighting for democracy and human rights sometimes in very harsh condition. Without further ado, I will welcome my, my partner in crime who did all of the heavy lifting and academic background of this, Sophia McLennan, and once again, repeat how grateful I am for all of you for being today with you. Thank you. Oh, uh, wonderful. Uh, um, very well done, uh, Sergio. Congratulations. Uh, again, lots of lots of congratulations in the comments as well. And we are getting um, some great questions in here. So looking forward to, to a great uh, dialogue here. Um, so one thing, and, and this is maybe a good place, um, Sophia, for, for you to kind of jump in here as well. There's, there's a question about, um, how, whether these strategies work as effectively in democracies as they do in authoritarian countries. I, I, I know you gave some specific ex examples in your, your slides, Sergio, but can you say anything um, about that from kind of a, a higher level, a broader view of, of the trends from what you've gathered from your research? Welcome, Sophia. So our research shows that it doesn't really matter. Um, the failures such as they, you know, the, one of the things we were interested in was looking at failure. 
Um, the failures happen when the dilemma action isn't tailored appropriately to the, to the issue. And the failures happen when the activists, uh, for example, uh, target the wrong topic. We have an example of a uh, pussy riot um, playing in Russia in a church and that going badly in part because they did not anticipate that the public would react to this as sacrilegious. And so the message that they had in their action got lost in the fact that the venue was the wrong place. Um, if you try to be naked in Saudi Arabia, that's not gonna go well. So again, um, it's not about democracy per se, it's about, it, it's about adjusting the tactic to the topic and the context. And so that's a big part of what we're trying to do is show people which combinations are gonna be the most effective um, and, and to try to teach, like to winnow out um, results because we measure we measured in pranksters across nine metrics. We're actually now measuring across something closer to 15. And so we'll be able to say, well, this will work to get public attention, but it might not get you concessions. So we're starting by having more cases to be able to, to match that up. So did you have anything to add there before we move on to the, the next question? Yes, actually, the, 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 what, what really amazed me is not only the difference, well, the difference, the, the, not only that you, you find this type of actions being effective, uh, regardless of the level of social space you have, they tend to be more edgy in dictatorships because they come with a kind of the risk, but they tend to be similarly effective against the Volkswagen in, 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 uh, in U.S., or against the mayor in Panama City, which is a you know type of democracy or something like that. But basically, it's not about the level of Sofia says of the social space. Yeah. What really struck me when we were researching this is we started with several tags. So we say it's human rights struggle, it's a pro-democracy struggle, it's accountability struggle, and then we find all of this cluster about environment. It's so probably 20, 30% of the cases, I don't know the exact numbers because we are still counting, but, but you can find zillions of, of cases only in India. You know, the pranks and dilemma actions defined as a part of the environmental struggle. So seems that regardless of the topics or environment, the people are figuring out how to use this. And it's more about understanding the pattern and using the pattern effectively than, than, uh, than what the topic may be. I, I can't really say works better in autocracies, works better in, it's like, it, it seems to work better if people exercise it properly, regardless of the context. Right. And so, as you said, you know, there are these, these patterns that, that develop. And, I, you know, I think that the hope is that people who are trying to use them as, as a force for good, whatever that looks like in their, in their particular cause, pick them up. But um, we, we have a question here about how much the, the bad guys, so to speak, are, are also picking up and, and utilizing some of these tactics. So, uh, yeah, he wants me to start. Uh, so the, the, the answer to that is yes, um, as happens with any activism. Um, as soon as you land on something effective, your opponent will uh, attempt to block it or anticipate it. Um, we also have examples for, um, it, from the US of say the alt-right um, deploying some of the similar types of social media tactics that we've seen the left use. So this is a never ending moving wall, but the core, um, so the core type of tactic, for example, when Serge was saying the yes men use what we call supportive dilemma actions. That means they pretend to support, uh, I'm sorry, they use corrective ones. They just embody the thing they're critiquing and act the way they want it to. So that type of, of behavior, that's sort of one of these six major types you can do. And so you might not dress up as a CEO 15 times in a row because that didn't work. Now you're gonna do a different type of corrective. So what we see is 
the issues um, will need a certain kind of type to, to work as the counter, but how you deploy it will have to change. And part of that too is because the public will get what we call issue fatigue. So environmental activists can't surround trees endlessly. That's not how that's gonna work, but they can do the same type of tactic. They just have to be innovative and creative in how it works. Um, it's, it's a lot of uh, sort of what Sergio likes to refer to as, you know, political jujitsu, right? You're always adapting and you're always working to deflect your opponent. The thing that one of the things that that I want to add, which is more of my experience uh, working with uh, with the pro democracy groups, or 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 or, or uh, environmental activists, than than the real finding, is also what we are trying to distinguish is how it works when you mock a politics versus how it works when you mock an individual. Because you know, mocking the individual can sometimes backfire. And this is, this is a slippery slope of designing these things. You may want to talk about the person's, you know, bad policies about building the wall, but when you start talking about the size of the hands of the person, then it becomes a backfiring place. And uh, the thing with bad guys, is that they always tend to kill the messengers. So what happens when you are challenging the authority and then the government tries to make a dilemma action or a leftist action or kind to mock, they are very often targeting, uh, targeting individuals. So somehow in the battle between David and Goliath, this thing looks like better designed to serve David. Because if you are in the position of power and you are mocking a small group that is challenging you, you're actually giving a credibility to this group. If you're mocking the topic that they're talking about, you're actually giving a large platform to this topic. So it may end giving the public awareness to the topic that the group wants to outline if you try to use your, your machinery. We are very often talking about the very asymmetric systems where one side has more resources, more media. And if you make that side use their media against you, you're actually winning. You're winning numbers, you're winning coverage, you're winning, uh, your people are championing your topic. It becomes, so for these guys who are in a Goliath position, it seems to be well designed for the people who are in David in, a, in a David position or in a superior position, it tends to be slippery slope to spend too much on their resources on anything regarding uh, mocking the, the opposition. And I think this is this is one of the things. So it's 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 not once again against the good guys and the bad guys. It's about the size of the of the of the actors. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and that that leads to to another question that we have here uh, about outcomes as well. So there's you know certainly been um, I guess the the question at its 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 most basic level is is how much do the does activism and do dilemma actions really change the power dynamics? Whether you're talking about Authoritarian rule, corporate dominance—you know these types of things. Yeah, so we actually measure a lot of different types of outcomes. So you have practical uh, things like does uh, using dilemma actions and laftivism help protect protesters from more violent uh, punishment? That's an obviously a super important piece of this. Does it help build the movement? Does it help the movement continue? So there's those sort of very specific things, but then we also look at the question of does it reframe the narrative? And again, that's, that's sort of a different um, piece of this, but one which is essential. So if your uh, movement is able to take an opponent that's been seen to be scary or, or even if it's just the case of what the Yes Men did with Dow Chemical, right? So you have this big corporation, if you can break that facade and you can restructure that, then we consider that a significant outcome. So we measure across a range of types of, of outcomes. And again, you can see in certain cases, you're gonna be more effective on narrative. Laftivism is very effective on narrative, for example, more than the traditional just dilemma action because it literally changes the story. But it may be less effective in building members of the movement especially if the leftivism itself requires, say, somebody to dress up like a clown. So we can really start to see 
um, uh, like I said, a range of metrics on outcomes, and that's one of the things that we're really focusing on. Uh, the question would be, would it be useful early in your movement to do laftivism that helps reframe the narrative, and then later on, a more traditional dilemma action that doesn't require quite the same level of buy-in so that you can keep getting those numbers growing. So those are some of the things that we're looking at in the bigger case study. Mm -hmm. now, speaking about the, about the power of narrative in, in nonviolent struggle, uh, uh, there are Two engines of like when you take a if you take a look at the social changes of video game, they're like there is this balance between the status quo and the change, and it relies on two phenomena. In autocracy, people are too afraid to act. In traditional democracy, people are too apathetic to act. They are too busy doing other things. So if you can prove that these things impact fear. And you know, makes the police look ridiculous or make Putin look afraid of toys and you know, all of this kind of stuff. Or you can make, or you can make, uh, uh, you know, people care because now they can touch Dow Chemicals. Now they can touch Volkswagen. Now, 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 now it matters to them. And immediately these things are not happening to somebody else, they're happening to you. And when they're happening to you, you're more likely to be engaged. So if you can prove that it impacts fear narrative and apathy narrative, I think that that it's you're very close to the idea that it, this impacts social change seriously. One other thing, uh, you know, it's very difficult to measure the impact of tactics on the success of the movements. This is not how the things are going. For movements to be successful, they need vision, they need strategy, and yes, they need effective tactics. However, what we're trying to do, we are running to use the data set done by Maria Stefan and Erika Chenovet, which are looking to over 600 different campaigns from the point of success. So what we try to do, we are looking at their campaign data set. We are finding the campaigns which tend to be successful or unsuccessful, nonviolent campaigns. And we are running this against our database and saying, okay, whether we can prove that the movements that were using dilemma actions or loftivism at certain stage where they are more likely to succeed than the average movements in this data set. So uh, you don't try to extrapolate, say, you know, this movement was successful because of the tactics. Movements are never successful only because of the tactics. Movements are successful because of so many different things. But if you can show the correlation, you can, you can say, you know, if you want to build a movement, if you use the LM action, if you use loftivism, you're more likely to succeed, which is the findings we are searching for. Yeah, and I'll just jump in and add one extra thing here, which is that, um, and this is sort of how Serge and I first met, um, because I'm really interested in irony. So all repressive structures are intrinsically ironic. So that's the thing that's kind of fun, right? So I'm an autocrat. I say, I'm taking care of my country. You need me. Well, that's a situational irony. My story about myself does not match what I'm really doing. So when you're when the action itself can reveal that as a falsehood, as a lie, right? So situational irony is the type of irony that's not fun at all. <laughs> if you can use the fun side of irony to expose that, to show that the police that are supposed to be there to, collect, to protect the people are not protecting the people are in, and are instead a source of you know, danger, then you've, you've unraveled, right? You've, you've shown that the emperor is in fact naked. So that's really kind of the fun thing. And you can see that working in all of the different contexts that we're studying. Okay. So there's two questions here that are kind of along a similar theme. I'm going to, to try my best to, to combine them here. So um, one had to, to do about this kind of notion of, of jokes failing because they're, they're too offensive uh, and, and what you know, how does that figure in here? And then to, to follow on that, ours the, the, is the, the pussy riot example or that the naked protest in Saudi Arabia, is that an example? Are those examples of, you know, something that kind of violates a cultural script or something that, that, that people might deem offensive? I think that's absolutely right. I mean, you are always in this space where you take um, a risk that you will, that the messaging will get lost. Um, and pranksters, we talk about, for example, the kneeling at the national anthem um, and the controversy that came out of that and explain that, um, first of all, that wasn't truly a dilemma action, but even still, the problem was that that conversation started to be about patriotism and not about 
uh, you know, uh, police brutality, which is what, uh, you know, Colin Kaepernick wanted the story to be about. So, so the pussy riot is an example, again, of it got lost in the, in the shuffle because people were insulted. And so that is, you know, the kind of thing where you can think about it and say, well, what are the risks here in the story that could emerge from this? Um, if I do this, what are the ways in which this tactic could be misunderstood? And so again, that's, that's one of those things that can literally happen everywhere. It's not a question so much of having a joke that was inappropriate. It's more that you just didn't understand that you're trying to tap into a widely held belief. This is a core piece of a dilemma action. If the widely held belief is that the police should not just kill people, then kneeling during an anthem might not help them make that connection. So that's what we're saying. You have to figure out what the widely held belief is that you're going after. You have to make sure that the tactic exposes that effectively. Yeah, once again, uh, it, it goes down to the, to the structural thinking about the tactics. And this is also the part of what we teach in Canvas. As Sophia says that, you know, when you take a look at why something failed, it's either the, the, the problem of not understanding the widely held belief, but we call this a targeting problem. So you want to target the fact that the church, which should be uh, separated from state, is in bed with government in Russia. But you don't do that by, by getting to the place where the holiest bones of the holiest saint is and then desecrated with a punk show, because then it will be about desecration of the church. It won't be about Putin being with that with patriarch. If, however, you point that the patriarch had a golden crown and rides in Bentley, and the people in church shouldn't be riding in Bentley, it's yet another different thing. So it's like a targeting is a very important part of this, which is why in every case where we, did, we, we are looking at, we're looking at who the target is. And sometimes you can pick the wrong target, and sometimes you can pick the wrong tactics. So that's the difference of, of between uh, failing in terms of, of, of calling Kaepernick and, uh, and uh, Pussy Riot, and in the same time failing with, you know, uh, Femen, the, the great female right groups that does a lot of nude protests, and they use their bodies as a billboard, and it's an art, and it tells a story about how women shouldn't be treated as a sexual object. But when you do this as a young Muslim, in front of the Egyptian embassy, this is not going to gain you sympathy of Egyptians. This is going to show you somebody promoting porn, you know, discussing the norms. If you want to fight for, for female rights, if you want to expose the hypocrisy of a tough uh, Sharia type of, of oppressive government who deprives women from rights, you take a look at the driving protests in Saudi Arabia. So now you have women who can't drive. Now you have women who are giving the driving lessons. Now you have hundreds of women doing this. And now you have a thing which equally impacts the men and women in Saudi Arabia. Because I'm on this call because my wife has taken two of my kids by our car somewhere else. Otherwise, you couldn't be hearing me from the noise. Imagine if me or my male cousin should be employed just to drive the car because my wife can't do it. And now this is very different than, than showing breasts in public. And this is like, once again, you can miss the target or you can miss the tactic, but most of the time is one of these two. So I would rather look at how the target and tactic are selected than saying, oh, you know, this thing worked more in the autocracies, this thing worked more in a tough religious environment. I, I would rather look at the, structure and skill than the condition. Mm -hmm. Structure and skill comes with the fact that you have done your homework and you know your conditions. So you have a very good idea how this thing will impact your target audience. And yes, sometimes, you, sometimes these things are effective even without being politically incorrect. We spend a day talking about, about this thing in Burma, where you had a military junta, and then you have a generals. So why then the women across the world start sending their underwear to the Burmese embassies? And the, the generals were completely caught off guard. So in order to understand this, you need to know that a lot of them share this superstition coming from a cult-like belief that somehow touching female underwear will 
deprive them from their mucho macho powers. So it won't impact me. It won't impact you. I'm the person who, who is, you know, this, this how it's called, the, the husband on a remote control that's been traveling across the world and visiting Victoria's Secrets. And I can touch these things, but these guys, they can't. So it won't work against me, but works against them. For them, it's terrifying. So you, it also takes a look at the target and understanding what will make a trigger for them to act the way you want them to act. So all of these examples we, we've been talking about, at least as, if I, if I can, can recall them all correctly, have been physical actions, tangible things in the world. I'm wondering if, if there are examples that you've come across in your research of dilemma actions that have taken place entirely in the digital realm. Yeah, we have some really good ones. And in fact, we have ones that you think of that are sort of hybrid. So we have uh, hologram protests in Spain. So you're not allowed to protest. And instead what the activists did was they had people send in um, short video of themselves marching and then they blended them all into, if folks are interested in this, I encourage you to look it up because it's incredible. So you see this massive protest that's all just protect, projected holograms. Um, and so we're seeing some very sophisticated creativity when it comes to that. But there's also completely digital examples um, for really good reasons. Um, fake websites are common. Again, uh, those can be tricky in the land of irony because people might not completely understand them. Uh, we have examples of Orange Alternative uh, selling, auctioning off uh, military weapons um, in Sweden to you know, see if they can sort of shame the military for the stockpiles they have. That is a good example of one that didn't really work very well. There wasn't a lot of uh, interest in the website and you know, the, um, that, that was a, an example of one that failed. But hashtags, um, all of this stuff can be quite effective. There's, there's lots of examples that are totally digital. Um, and uh, you know, we see, I think we'll see that again, not just in more repressive contexts, but also in, in contexts where people just feel uh, like they want to remain anonymous. Yeah, one yeah, more what... thing to add to this, uh, to embolden the, 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 the idea I tried to sell throughout the presentation. Sometimes you do the harmless thing and then your opponent reaction turns it into success. Sometimes you use your opponent's reaction. So there's this very iconic photo of Barack Obama and Xi Jinping. And for some reason, somebody dug up on the internet that Xi actually looks like Winnie the Pooh, the cartoon character. Now, immediately people start sharing this in a very restricted environment of China. And then the Chinese censors took it off and say, this is harming the authority of the dear leader. And immediately the Winnie Pooh is banned across the China. So probably it is 10 to 15 times more people start paying attention after Winnie Pooh was banned in China. Then they were taking, taking attention to these memes. But this is typical thing, you start a little mock and then your opponent just can't stand it. And they do something ballistic and it kind of impacts more audience or pays more attention to you. So sometimes you use this jujitsu, the power of your opponent. And very often you, it, I mean, it's unexpected for me and you. I find Winnie Pooh very appealing character. My kids love Winnie Pooh. I would like to be compared with Winnie Pooh, but for some reason, some censors in China think, oh, this is awful. Let's ban Winnie Pooh. It is the ban that really made the thing explode. Now from China, you can't access Winnie Pooh anymore. And then people start, why I can't access the Winnie Pooh? And then they make the connection. Yeah, the, the, other, the other example I was, I was thinking about as, as you've been, you were talking is um, over the summer, uh, Donald Trump held a, a rally in Oklahoma, I believe it was. And there were a bunch of people on Twitter, like K-pop Twitter, like went on his, his registration website and TikTok. flooded it. And, uh, oh yeah, TikTok. And they, you know, didn't actually go to this event and the, the, the stadium was like a quarter full or something because all these people had fake registration. Yeah, it was even worse. It was the fact that you had millions of people appearing to buy things 
and tickets. So they build the inside space and the outside space because they thought there will be 200,000 people because this is how many tickets they, they sold. So once again, this is a digital action, but as Sofia says, it, it's not fully effective until you see the empty stadium, until it happens in the real world. So it uses digital as a platform to organize but as most of the digital campaign, as Ice Bucket Challenge, it really has impact if it has a real world component. If it ends up by people banning Winnie Pooh in China. Right. Uh, so one final question here, unless anyone has, has more questions, um, you can, you can uh, put them in the, the Q&A, but I'm gonna switch gears here um, for, for just a second, uh, Sergio, and ask um, your thoughts on the current regime in Serbia? Um, are we witnessing a return to the, the, the 1990s with the Milosevic regime, some of those folks coming back to power? And what do you think about the growing influence of Russia and China? Well, these are two, two separate things. The people are the same. The politics are different. Unfortunately, the leadership style is very similar. So first of all, we won't be getting back to 90s. There won't be civil wars in Balkans anymore. Uh, we learned our lesson and we learned it hard. So I don't think that this is the future of the region is more civil wars. Unfortunately, we are living in a world uh, which experiences its most democracy downwards trend since 1991. The part of this is COVID, which is the air, like the emergency situation is the air the autocrats breathe. It can always be used for abuse of the power restriction of freedoms, relying on state, controlling media. It has been like that uh, since the beginning of the time. And unfortunately, we are witnessing the, the governments abusing the fact that you can't gather in public to further restrict freedoms on internet. And you know, you can name the, the democratic countries or autocratic countries. And unfortunately, we are, if you take a look at the Freedom House Index of Democracy, which came out a few weeks ago, it's actually very, very depressive. We are witnessing the downfall of democracy. Unfortunately, the, the fact that America and India fell on this, on this thing, on this thing actually impacts the world because it's a billion and a 300 million people, something like that. So, but speaking of this, we are living in a world where 66% of the population live in some form of autocracy. So welcome to the, to the new world. Serbia is unfortunately not an example. It's not leading the show. It's the part of the wider trend. Uh, this trend I, you can call Putinization or you can call Erdoganization. It's a very interesting phenomenon how this guy who championed uh, strengthening democratic institutions in Turkey against the military coup ended up being, uh, being, uh, being a person who imprisons most journalists in the world, Saudi Arabia. I think so, only Saudi Arabia beats, beats Turkey now the number of imprisoned journalists, or you can call urbanization. So we have this guy called Orban in the middle of the European Union. And when you take a look at the broader trend, what is really terrifying is that the major part of democracy backlash is not coming from places that are traditional autocracies. Burmese junta is just a small part of the show. It's not that Kim Jong-uns are, are becoming particularly effective in maintaining autocracy. It unfortunately looks like democratically elected leaders tend to topple democracy from above. So the major backlash is coming from places like India, which has been democracies for years and years and years. And here is the Modi trying to make one party rule. The Serbian president, the Serbian government, it's only you know, the smaller son of the bigger gods. They are the copycats of these, of these larger people. And, and it's, a, it's a sad trend because it's coming, uh, it's coming from my own country, but it's a trend. So I think the, the grand lesson here is if you look at promoting democracy, if you look at teaching democracy, uh, you need to figure out how to defend democracy rather than attack dictatorships, how to strengthen the institutions from being toppled how to boost the voters' participation, which tends to be the very important part of defending democracy to start with, and how to recognize and target authoritarian tendencies of democratically elected leaders. But the most important part of this 
is once again, not my favorite American president, Ronald Reagan, but my favorite quote from American president, democracy and freedom are only one generation away from extinction, always. So no democratic institutions will hold if the people abandon it. And the people in democracies, and this is a proven trend, they tend to take democracy for granted. It's not granted. It needs to be defended. Yes, that is a, a theme across all of our work here in the in the McCourtney Institute, all of our our events and our, our podcasts and our programming. Um, we did have one question come in here that I that, that I think is a good one. So we will we will end here. Um, how do we get around the so-called bubble effect of social media to gain exposure for actions and and get the target audience to see? these actions as they're happening? So um, in our research, and Sergio can talk about this more, um, the, if you want to have the media coverage of your action to be effective, you actually have to plan it. You can't just sit back and expect that the coverage will be what you want. So we talk a lot about um, the moment when you're designing your action that you have in place what we call your post-production um, and so that's active people within your group who are prepared to share images and other components of the action through social media but also to build relationships with journalists so um, this is not something that you want to just sort of uh, leave up to the whims of of the energy of you know the folks that follow your story you really want to be deliberate about it that will be much 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 more effective i agree also also very big part of the of the modern uh, of the contemporary discussion about this is you don't want to miss love uh, you don't want to make to 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 make mistake to to kind of a uh, to mistake activism for selectivism. Sharing, liking, that's expression of opinion. In order to be effective, social media engagement needs to have the offline lag. So it's not like you're sharing a thing, it's like you're signing a petition. <laughs> it's not like you're right liking a thing, you need to make a real world phone call. So getting in the real world is where the change is really happening. And then using social media to boost this cycle and spread the word, it's, it's also very effective. But, but take a look at the most effective social media campaigns where they are related to the democracy struggles or they are like, you know, charity kind of stuff. They work only if they have the clearly two legs, one in a virtual world and one in the real world. Same works for dial actions. So it's like, it works for activism in general. Well, we will leave it there. Uh, thank you both for, for your work on this project and for the great Q&A. Um, I, I should mention for, for everyone watching, um, if you registered for this webinar, you'll get an email tomorrow uh, that will include several links, one of which being a link to, to purchase pranksters versus autocrats. Q Serja, there we go. Uh, you can find it wherever you get your books. So thank you, Serja. Thank you, Sophia. Congratulations again, Serja. Uh, thank you, Larry. Thank you, Michael, Chris, uh, for your efforts here. And uh, we will sign it off there. Thanks, everybody. Have a good evening. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Great being part of this.